Hello and welcome to the Speaking Archaeologically lecture on how can language be interpreted in the case of Homo neanderthalensis. In this lecture, we shall be discussing popular debates regarding the phonetic abilities of Homo neanderthalensis, debates regarding the cognitive abilities of Homo neanderthalensis, and debates regarding the symbolic behavior of Homo neanderthalensis. Hopefully, by the end of this lecture, you will be able to interpret in your own terms what language would have meant for the Neanderthals. Human language is one of the most defining characteristics of modern humans. It is a system of abstract logic that allows humans to extend their rational ability and has often been virtually equated with their abstract logical ability. There are different theories associated with the origin of language and while some support the view that language is a unique human trait, others believe that it must have evolved from some pre-linguistic form and that production of sounds is not unique to Homo sapiens alone because audible signals capable of expressing language do not require any particular phonetic apparatus, but only the ability to produce sound. However, the ability to produce sounds cannot always be equated with language. Language can be defined as the acquirement and use of complex systems for communication, while speech is the vocalized form of communication. Recent researchers have shown that no other animal except modern humans has the vocal mechanism that is necessary to produce the sounds of human speech. This lecture attempts to study the debate between language and speech and attempts to establish how the concept of language can be interpreted in the case of Homo neanderthalensis. For this purpose, the anatomical and cognitive capabilities of the species and the various debates regarding them will be studied and a conclusion will be arrived at. Debates regarding the phonetic abilities of Homo neanderthalensis One of the important studies on the phonetic abilities of Homo neanderthalensis was conducted by Philip Lieberman and Edmund S. Krellin. This was based on an earlier study that proposed that newborn humans lack the anatomical mechanism necessary to produce speech. In this case, Lieberman and Krellin proposed that the supralaryngeal vocal apparatus of Neanderthals was similar to that of a newborn human infant. Referring to the acoustic theory of speech production, this study proposed that the activity of the larynx that determines the fundamental frequency of vowel sounds and in human speech, the phonetic qualities that differentiate vowels like I and A from each other are determined by the resonant modes of supralaryngeal vocal tract. On the basis of the study, they studied the supralaryngeal vocal tract of a Neanderthal, compared it to that of a newborn human infant and an adult Homo sapien, and the following similarities were noticed. The mastoid process varied greatly in an adult human but was absent in a newborn infant and relatively small in Neanderthals. The shape of the Neanderthal skull and that of the newborn infant had similar shape and the mandible and morphology of the base of the skull. Both the skulls lacked a chin and shared ponged features. In both the cases, the mandible was stronger than the ramus, unlike the case of the modern human where mandible and ramus were nearly equal. The inclination of mandibular ramus and mandibular foramen were similar in the skulls of Neanderthals and newborn human infants. The dental arch of the maxillas was U-shaped as opposed to the V-shaped dental arch of modern humans. The occipital condyles were relatively small and elongated in both the cases and the nasal and oral cavity of the Neanderthals were similar to that of a human infant. The size of the pharynx is small in both cases due to a much higher hyoid bone than that of an adult human. This study concluded that Neanderthals were incapable of producing various vowel and consonant sounds, but their vocal tract had more speech ability than non-human primates despite the lack of anatomical prerequisites for producing full-range human speech. These observations were criticized by Bo and others who in 2007 insisted that the Neanderthal vocal tract was comparable to that of a 10-year-old human child and also the production and articulation of extreme vowels such as A, I, U depended on the cognitive ability to control the jaw, the tongue and the lips. Lieberman and Krellin were also criticized on the grounds of methodological and interpretive flaws and the accuracy of the observations like absence of the mastoid process, the inclination of mandibular foramen, the absence of chin and the U-shaped maxilla 
were questioned on the basis of extensive remodeling of La Chapelle au Saint Neanderthal skull, which was used by Lieberman and Quellen, that had taken place before the death of the individual. Some studies also argued that many human beings also shared the same characteristics as the said Neanderthal skull and were capable of normal speech despite this, and hence it was wrong to conclude that Neanderthals were incapable of modern human speech. In 2008, a separate study was done on two Neanderthal fossils and it was concluded that the FOXP2 gene that enables speech was found in Neanderthals around 300,000 years ago, before the population split between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis occurred. In 2009, based on another independent study, which also studied the anatomical characteristics of chimpanzees, Lieberman and others concluded that while the anatols lacked the vocal tract to produce human vocal tract size calibrating sounds and syllabic encoding in their speech, they had some sort of a language which may have been an intermediate stage in the evolution of language. They supported the proposition that Neanderthals may have employed gestural communication as well as vocal signals. However, despite all these debates, nothing can be said for certain in the case of Neanderthals, though it is generally agreed that the, this species was capable of producing some sounds which may have been used as communicative signals. Debates regarding the cognitive abilities of Homo neanderthalensis Compared to the modern human beings, the brains of the Neanderthals were relatively larger. Studies show that the Neanderthals could make use of sophisticated tools and control fire, and that they lived in shelters, made and wore clothing out of animal hides, and were skilled hunter-gatherers. As far as tool-producing techniques are concerned, they were not fundamentally different from the tools made by modern Homo sapiens either at the initial stages of contact. Therefore, when it comes to cognition abilities of the Neanderthals, the argument for the lack of cognitive fluidity in Homo neanderthalensis is opposed by the argument that there could not have been dramatic cognitive differences between this species and modern humans. In their series of papers, Thomas Wynne and Frederick L. Coolidge support Hayden and propose that Neanderthals relied on a form of expert cognition or long-term working memory which was probably enhanced in modern Homo sapiens. They explain this postulate further with the example of the Lavalua technique and argue that this technique required a certain level of technical cognition and there is no reason to believe that Neanderthals performed Lavalua reduction differently and hence they possessed almost the same level of technical cognition as modern humans but not the same level of expert cognition. They take this analysis further and suggest that the expert cognition in humans led to the further possibility of greater phonological storage or ability to retain sounds, which in turn led to an enhancement of pragmatics of modern speech. Since the Neanderthals lacked expert cognition, therefore, according to this theory, speech was not a part of the cognitive behavior of the Neanderthals. Opposed to this, it was argued that phonological storage per se is not a unique access route for subsequent language processing or cognition and with the example of patients suffering from memory loss, it was concluded that there is no evidence that the absence of enhanced phonological memory precludes the effective use of language and hence there is no reason to believe that Neanderthals were not capable of speech. Debates regarding the symbolic behaviour of Homo neanderthalensis Symbolism in the form of art, rituals and burials has been another debatable topic in the study of Homo neanderthalensis. It is still doubtful whether symbolically mediated behaviour is exclusive to humans or whether it also existed among the Neanderthals. One of the first few debates that arose regarding the symbolic behaviour of Neanderthals was because of excavation of the Shanidar caves in Iraq when Neanderthal skeletons were found buried in what appeared to be a deliberately dug pit or graves. During the examination of the faunal assemblage of the cave, high densities of flower pollen were found in the sediments over a claimed burial, which were interpreted as reeds of flowers laid across the grave. However, it seems more likely that pollen was a contaminant, which probably blew into the cave or came inside the workman's boot. Another important burial is that of Lagar Wallow Boy, the skeleton of a young hominin which is considered to be a cross between Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. This skeleton was found in Portugal and was covered with red ochre and charcoal, tools and a pierced marine shell 
probably a pendant, lying near the throat of the child with animal bones near the head and feet. However, there is much debate regarding this burial which resembles Upper Paleolithic burials as well as status of this individual as a Neanderthal child or a human hybrid. In 2011, a large number of personal ornaments, decorated bone tools and colorants from Grotte du Rouen, RC sur Cure, France, from the Chateau Peronian were studied and it was concluded that the finds were indeed Neanderthal material culture. Thus, while a strong argument can be made that these objects may have been scavenged from human sites by Neanderthals or were simply imitated, it is also possible that they may have been carved by Neanderthals. After studying the various debates about the anatomical and cognitive abilities of the Neanderthals, it is difficult to interpret what language would have meant for them. On one hand, it is evident that the species had some, if not complete, anatomical features which were favourable for production of sounds. However, from the observations made by Carlyle, Bo and others, it can be concluded that the speech is not affected by anatomical features alone but also depends on the cognitive ability to coordinate the movement of lips, jaws and the tongue. But this ability to produce sounds was used as communicative signals, as Lieberman suggested, is difficult to say. However, if Beeman's theory about phonological memory is believed, it is probable that the Neanderthals had a simple non-grammatical language which was not as complex as the modern human language but was used nevertheless to convey specialized vocalized messages of some sort. Additionally, it's worth a thought that the ability to articulate speech alone cannot be called language and referring to the definition of language proposed by Croft and Kurse in 2004, it can be concluded that symbolic art like beads, standardized tools, decorated bones can also be used as a form of language much like the modern symbolic objects like wedding bands are used for symbolic representation of marital status of a person. There is no reason to assume that Neanderthals were not capable of such re symbolic representation and it is highly probable that beads, bones and standardized tools were used by the species in order to convey a distinct social message. Perhaps it was a mark of identification or just a method of distinguishing one group of individuals from another. Thus, despite the lack of sufficient evidence, it will not be wrong to say that the Neanderthals had some sort of medium of communication. Whether it was sounds produced by relatively primitive anatomical features as compared to humans, or some expert cognition, or the use of symbolic art to convey a social message, it may be borne in mind that language primarily is a system of other complex systems such as sounds, speech, gestures and symbols to communicate a special message.